The following program has been brought to you by Tiger Media Net. That program being, it came from the DVD collection. Hello and welcome to the podcast. My name is John Billinger and this is... Uh, Connor Keating. And today, we will be reviewing The Invisible Man from 1933. Ooh, the oldest movie we've done yet. And this movie is a part of a, shall we say, collective here. The Universal Studios Monsters Classic Collection. Classic monster titles with a haunting new look and a price to die for. That is the VHS the promotional trailer for these movies from the 90s. Um, the Invisible Man, yes, from 1933. Bit of background on this movie. This movie was made by Universal Studios in the early 1930s. It stars Claude Rains. It was directed by James Whale. And... It is the introduction of the universal monster, the Invisible Man. The only monster to never rise from the dead. Because all the other Invisible Man movies made by Universal during this time period were all separate. We're all different Invisible Men, okay? Uh, We might cover some of those one day, maybe not. We'll see. And to get us started on the film, what are your general thoughts on the movie? Okay, so I am... I'll just flat out say right now, I am not, like, uh, a fan of the Universal Monster movies. That does not mean that I, like, I don't like them. It's just, um, I'm more of a of a creature feature kind of guy. So, I've never been too interested in most of the Universal Monster movies because they are just kind of, like, they're, they're guys. You know, they, they might be dead guys, but most of them are just kind of, like, guys. Uh, and so, really, the only one that ever interest me all that much was like uh the gill man so i've got so i've seen all the creature uh creature films um but like aside from that the only other exposure i have to the universal monsters is like monster squad uh monster squad we gotta review that one yeah we should review that. that's a good movie um but anyways so this was so but you know while i say that i i still i don't know interested enough to be like oh hey you want to watch this movie ah sure We'll okay. check it out. I haven't seen uh, any of these movies, and so I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of yeah. the Universal movies. He's a big though. fan of those. It's like one of my uh, probably favorite things of all time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really like this movie. Do you like this? Movie? I uh, I enjoyed this film. It's pretty good. It's a uh, <laughs> it, it's an inter- interesting film. It wasn't quite what I expected, to be honest. Yeah. Um, Was it your only exposure to the Invisible Man? Like the um, Invisible Man appears, the Japanese film. I have not seen that film, but, like, yeah, that's, like, uh, I probably know a little bit more about that film, and even then, I don't know much about that film than, uh, yeah, I know. That one's Kurosawa doing the effects, right? Er, not Kurosawa, no, uh, what the hell? <laughs> Kurosawa, um, uh, Tsuburaya, yeah. Yeah, Tsuburaya. Yeah, Tsuburaya, yeah. Tsuburaya doing the effects. <laughs> Sorry, I got the names. Uh, right. Ray, the, the director of the Japanese version of Gigantus the Fire Monster, uh, also directed Invisible Man Appears, uh, but anyways... <laughs> So yeah, yeah there's that, a tie-in to an older review. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. that that film is not connected at all to these no. films. That's a different, completely invisible. different thing. Completely yeah. different thing. Mm-hmm. All right, but um, I really like this movie. Mm-hmm. It's a really good movie. And I, I, yeah, it's one. Of, I I think it's one of the best. Okay. Um, and you just really enjoy it. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. It's a uh, like what I was kind of going in expecting was that it was going to be um, a lot slower more like about the scientist doing this experiment trying to turn himself invisible he turns himself invisible and then somehow he kills people right because yeah. because they got to do that in the end and so i was a little like surprised um how fast it goes like how quickly the reveal of him being invisible happens yeah and also just like the um uh yeah the fact that it didn't really have that whole the beginning that i thought it would because it just kind of like begins with uh, the Invisible Man, uh, you know, he's all bandaged up, walking into a um, yeah. a pub, essentially, and asking for a room. And then most of, like, the first act is him trying to find a reverse formula to it. Yeah, well, we'll uh, get and, to more of that yeah. the synopsis. And then he, of course, goes on a rampage. Well, there you go. There's his synopsis. Oh, well, get a more, uh, get a more detailed uh, synopsis. The story of this movie is, uh, is Jack Griffin is a scientist who's uh, found a... Uh, 
He's created a chemical that can turn himself invisible. And now he has to turn himself back to be a visible man, you know? So he goes to this, uh, you know, pub in, like, the outback country in England, basically. Yeah. And he does his experiment there. Uh, he's trying to find a way to, you know, turn back visible, but he's failing, like, over mm -hmm. and over again. And, and the people in the pub keep pestering him. Yeah, it's Because, like, I mean, he's admittedly kind of like a... Uh, a little intimidating, a little weird, a little bit yeah. of a jerk. So he's wearing like this mask, like yeah. made of bandages. So it's like, what the hell? He's is got goofy on? glasses on. Yeah, and they're just like, I bet he's like some kind of escaped convict or something, <laughs> something like that. And then, um, but it turns out that the chemical he created to turn himself invisible has a uh, drug in there that slowly turns the user insane. Yeah, I thought so, that was I thought that was an interesting way to get him to become the, yeah, uh, so the villain. Yeah, so slowly he kind of just descends into a murderous villain mm -hmm. basically. <laughs> and does go on a rampage and his friends they want to help him out. Uh like his girlfriend, uh his his girlfriend's uh husband and then his best friend Kemp. His girlfriend's husband. <laughs> Not the, the his girlfriend's, girlfriend's dad. His girlfriend's dad and then the uh Jack's uh, friend Kemp, who each also he tries to like get him to do a partnership. Is like, yeah, we should have a partnership, Kemp. We'll plan out a few murders here and there. We'll kill them all. Maybe a train crash. <laughs> Which he does crash a train. He does yeah. crash a train. Uh, the Invisible Man has the highest kill count of any of the Universal monsters. By the way, he yeah. he killed like I I watched a video where they. They, they count all the kills. Mm -hmm. He's killed, like, over a hundred people in this movie. I'm sure... I don't know how many people are on that train, but, like, yeah. I... He's just a... He's just a jerk in this film. That's, like... What's interesting is, like, compared to some of the other movies, is, like... Um, no, of course, I haven't seen him, but, you know, like, uh, Dracula, he's doing it for blood or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Does the mummy kill that many people in his films? Uh... Well, the original mummy has a bit of a complex agenda. Okay, yeah. man. Uh, but, you know, like then the, like the werewolf or the gill man, they're probably doing it for... No, gill man's doing it to keep people out of his territory. Yeah. Wolf man wolf is man's... just doing it because he's a werewolf and yeah. werewolf probably needs to eat naturally people. Naturally kill people. Yeah. But, like, this guy is just a jerk, and he is just mm -hmm. doing it for fun. He's a jerk. Yeah. Well, he started out good, but then yeah. the drug... Yeah, the like drug... That's, what's, messed up that's also a cool part of this movie, I guess, too, is the fact that that you know it starts off like he's just a jerk but then eventually he becomes a psychopath so it's kind of a yeah interesting little thing there um i don't know exactly how his plan uh his like game plan is after he does I think his he partnership was planning to take over the world but he, he's like i need an a visible partner it's like i don't I, yeah, I don't know how that works exactly i think maybe that's part of the idea of like the uh the drug messing with his mind. He's not thinking clearly yeah. at all. And well, he also says something about he wants to sell the thing for yeah. billions. <laughs> Millions of dollars. And which, to be fair, back then, it was like uh, like the world... Like, World War One, it ended like 15 years mm -hmm. earlier. So that was probably like a very pressing idea to a lot of people. Make Second World War? Oh, no. So it's that's kind of like a... Yeah, because was it, this was 33. Um... 33, yeah. Which is the same year Hitler went to power. Hitler went into, Okay, I couldn't remember who it was. 34, 33... Okay, I think 34 was when he invaded Pol... No. no, no, that was 39. One issue, one little issue that I had with the story, at least kind of early on, is with, like, like the pacing or the structure of it. Because early on, um, I don't know, it seems like the A plot is what's, is the, what's going on at the pub with the Invisible Man. But then we keep cutting away to these, you know, this group of scientists who eventually his do... Friends. Yeah, his buddies, yeah. who eventually do become important to the story but early on i don't know they just kind of feel very expositiony and they feel very disconnected from the film like yeah. they're like an afterthought but like yeah once they you... come back and then yeah. the pub they don't show up again after that yeah that way of the film. which is a shame because you really liked the uno I really liked character. the old lady the, the maid who's like ah, God, get him out of me house ah! Um, <laughs> I also that, like... that is a character people either love or hate. Yeah, okay. That actress, she's also in Bride of Frankenstein. It's the same thing. She just screams a lot. Yeah. Just like, ah! Her so... husband's also funny too, because he's just like I don't know. He's just like a sad old guy who just wants to wants to yeah. serve drinks. Yeah. This is also a funny movie. Yeah. I should mention. Yeah. Like this, like like a legitimately funny, not mm -hmm. like a cheesy kind of funny. Yeah. Like, I <laughs> I found myself laughing um, with the film. Uh, more often than like, oh, haha, ha, look at the bad effects. No, the effects in this, 
We, should we I'm talk per- about that? Yeah, pretty uh, well, good. A little bit. We'll talk yeah. about that. Anyways, the effects, the effects are pretty good uh, for the time. And the comedy is pretty good. And like, the my comedy favorite, is pretty good. <laughs> my favorite line is uh, after he... Okay, is like when he reveals him after he reveals himself to be invisible. Yeah, yeah. Like he, there's, there's like a cop is trying to get him out of the pub. He's like, "Come quietly," and the invisible man's like, "All right, I'll take off these bandages and show you what you're messing with." And he takes off the bandages. And he's and the police officer and the group of guys he was runs out of there, and the invisible man's like, "Ha ha 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 ha," and the guys are just like, "Oh my God, what's the matter with him? He's invisible. That's the matter with him." <laughs> He takes yeah. the rest of his clothes off. We'll never catch him. <laughs> yeah, the police officer. Yeah, the police officer is good too. There's lots of great like bit parts in this film. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think like what's interesting is they're not even like main characters really. No, they're, they're just bit parts. They just give them character. They do help kind of uh, carry the uh, the first half of the film pretty much until yeah. like the scientists kind Become of trans- central transition part. from being like side characters to being like the main characters. It's very, very interesting to think about it the way. Yeah. I don't, um, Oh, sorry, I don't know if that, I don't know if it works. It kind of does, but it it makes it makes those early scientist scenes feel kind of disconnected. Um, yeah. But yeah, once the invisible man shows up at Kent at Kemp's house, uh, then they kind of uh, work their way into the story much yeah. more, uh, much better. I should mention this movie was directed by James Whale, who also directed movies like uh, Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein, and The Old Dark House and. Uh, he, he had a lot of humor in his movies, mm-hmm. you know, like dark humor, and you can see that in Bride of Frankenstein especially, and Old Dark House. So um, you can definitely see his his stamp in this film. Um, I guess what's next, we'll talk about the acting, because this, uh, this movie was made in the early 30s, during that transition period from silent films to talkies. So in a lot of these early talkies, there's like exaggerated acting yeah, and some... Yeah. Uh, below average acting, and I think uh, in this movie, for the most part, I think the acting's good. Yeah, there there is definitely uh, quite a bit of like overacting, though not like not like overacting is necessarily ah! the worst thing ever. Uh, it, it it more just kind of comes off as like yeah, what, what we're talking about, like it, it's funny. Um, so yeah, you got the old lady, yeah, you got lady. the policeman. <laughs> Uh, well, that's kind of like underacting, overacting. I don't know. He's it's, just he's just kind of trying like, to play it's it cool. Overly goofy. I think that's a better way of like describing it. He's like overly goofy. Yeah, but there's also some uh, not so good acting in the movie. Like uh, there's this one police officer who just sounds like he's like falling asleep. Is like he has to fall asleep at some point. <laughs> and that's kind of like was that intentional? <laughs> the director was just like, yeah, that's good. Maybe maybe just like a bored police officer. I don't know. <laughs> the actor who played the Invisible Man, Claude Rains, he did a really good job. Yeah, and this was also Claude Rains has had had a very long career and very interesting career. He was born like eighteen eighty nine, um, and he didn't. And this was his first movie he was ever in. Really? Yeah, he was primarily That's crazy. He was primarily a stage actor. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And. Then. Um, he also served in World War One and was blind in his left eye, I think, hmm. because of a gas attack or something like that. And um, the direct James Well, the director, he wanted someone with a very distinct voice to play the yeah, Invisible Man because you're not going to yeah, see his yeah, face for the majority of the film. A... So he had so he just looked through a bunch of rejected auditions that Universal had for other movies. He found Claude Rains's audition. He was like. That's it. That's the guy I want to be, the Invisible Man. And Claude Rains had a very long career in other movies after this, like, um, like, like let's say, uh, famous good movies like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington and Ooh. Casablanca. I, and, I've seen both those movies. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, some, shall we say, uh, B movies like the 1960 version of The Lost World, for example. Oh, I get to see that one. That's on the list, though. Um. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he plays the scientist. He also rejected uh, quite a few roles that would have uh, been in other noteworthy movies, hmm. like The Day the Earth Stood Still. He was wow. considered for Clot Two, but he rejected that one. And Bride of Frankenstein as well. So, um, very long career this guy had, and very good. Another actor of note in this movie is Henry Travers, who plays... Um, his girl, uh, Jack Griffin's girlfriend's father, Henry Travers, he's best known for playing Clarence the Angel in It's a Wonderful Life. And his girlfriend in the movie is an actress named Gloria Stewart, 
who in 1997 played Old Rose in Titanic. I mean, that is a very long career wow, right yeah, there. Wow, yeah, that's... Like, you said Titanic, it's like, whoa, that's quite a jump. <laughs> that's nine. That's 99, right? Yeah, 97. 97, okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit of a jump. Yeah, and actually, fun fact, they originally considered Faye Ray for playing Old Rose in Titanic. That would have been pretty cool. Uh, but she didn't want to do it. <laughs> and so they just they went with Gloria Stewart instead. But yeah, that's, that's a long... Long career long right career. there. Um, now let's talk about the effects, because the effects are the highlight of the movie. Mm -hmm. And the, the effects were done by a guy named John P. Fulton, who he basically had to invent green screen to do the effects in this movie. Like, what he had to have the Invisible Man you know, be invisible is that he filmed... They had uh, Claude Rains draped in, like, uh, black velvet, and they filmed him from a black velvet background, taking off his clothes and everything like that, and they overlaid that footage on the... Uh, the regular footage mm -hmm. and that's how they were able to do the effects in this movie and for the most part I mean there's some shots where they don't look as good as some of the yeah. other ones but for the most part the effects in this movie really hold up yeah, there's, and are a, there's, really good. Um, there's a number of scenes well not too many but there's a couple of scenes where like yeah it's a little flickery but for the most part um, it looks pretty uh, pretty dang good and um, I also really like it's not like necessarily an impressive effect, but I like the way that they have kind of like just like items floating. Yeah. Uh, and I assume that was strings. Yeah. But you don't see there are no strings in this film that yeah. you that are visible, and so yeah. you'll have like yeah floating cigarette, and it looks like somebody like actually like you know doing the yeah, motions. It's, it's pretty impressive. It's very impressive. And as for the flickering thing, I mean to be fair, we're also we watched this movie in HD, which is a format okay. this movie was never meant to be seen in. <laughs> That's like, true. they weren't thinking back in 1933 that anyone would even See think this about after this. after 1933? Yeah. It's like, back yeah. then, movies were, like, a one-time thing. Like, yeah. you make the movie, it goes into the vault for who knows how long. And yeah. This movie did and get regularly re-released yeah. back then. I'm sure um, it popped up on TV plenty of times back in the day. Yeah, in the 1957, the Universal Monsters had a new lease on life. Like long after they stopped making the original mm -hmm. ones uh, in 57, they sold them to television. That one of a legion of new fans. Um, well, yeah, that's a good time because that was kind of like the new monster boom at the time. Yeah, so it, it must have been quite an interesting time to be a mm -hmm. monster movie fan because you had, you had the old guard on the TV late at night. Like, you had Dracula and Frankenstein. Yeah. And some of the other ones that were made by the other studios like Columbia and Warner Brothers. And then you had, like, the new stuff. Like, you had uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon and... Uh, Beast from Twenty Thousand Fat, yeah, Giant Claw, Beast from Twenty Thousand Fathoms. <laughs> then he had the Japanese imports like Godzilla and Rodan. So that would have been a very that cool, would have been a cool time. It would have been very cool. You probably would have, probably maybe had more appreciation for the universe prior appreciation. For maybe. Okay. Well, yeah, you don't got of. as much um, options. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean they're cool. Come on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe one day I'll see some of the other ones. Well, yeah, through this show. Um, He's going to hey. force me to watch more. Uh, I kid, I kid. Hey, you liked it. Um, <laughs> and another thing to mention about the effects, um, it's important to talk about that there were a bunch of sequels made to The Invisible Man. Now, this movie is based off the H.G. Wells yes. book. Uh, I've, I'm going to sound like an idiot here, but I've never read the book. I own the book. I'm a bigger fan. <laughs> You, have you read the book? No. Oh, okay. I, I got a Jules Verne, not Jules Verne, H.G. Um, Wells. Wells collection. I have a Jules Verne collection, but it is an H.G. Wells collection. Mostly got it for, like, you know, War of the Worlds, Empire of the Ants, uh, First Men in the Moon. But, you know, it also had, like, yeah, Invisible Old Man and a couple other uh, stories of his. So so you might have to read the book now. I'll, I'll read it there. eventually. I, I heard that he had some uh, dissatisfaction with the, the movie. Hmm. Uh, he had, I guess, dissatisfaction over adaptations of his movies anyway, because the year before this movie came out, a movie called Island of Lost Souls came out. That was an adaptation of uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau, oh. and he didn't like the movie. <laughs> he would, I he certainly wouldn't have liked the uh, Val Kilmer uh, <laughs> Island of Dr. Moreau. Well, he was long dead. Yeah, I know that, that but still. And, Yikes. <laughs> oh, there's also a weird fact I've read about this movie. I, I don't know if it's this is true or not, but it's really weird. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the copyright okay. of the Invisible Man book and the character. 
So the book was written, I think, 1895. It came out in the 1890s, basically. Mm-hmm. So by now, the book is the in public domain. Yeah, because it was public domain super short back then. Yeah. But uh, you cannot use the Jack Griffin Invisible Man. That makes sense. Because Universal Studios purchased the film rights from him in 1933 to make this movie. So there's like some kind of weird legal loophole, okay? Where you can't use this Invisible Man. So what is that? In, do you know what that entails? Like you can't have like the, uh, the big re- glasses, the hat, the uh, bandages, the big coat. Like... Yeah, I don't think you can use that. No wonder. It's weird because they, they made the movie uh, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, which... I don't, are you familiar with that? It's a graphic novel series that basically adapts. Um, it's like it, they take a bunch of classic literature characters and they have them team up. Like, say, uh, uh, Captain Nemo. That was from, like, the 2010s, wasn't it? Yeah, the early, they made a movie of it in the early 2000s, yes. But they had, like, Captain Nemo, mm-hmm. Mina Harker from Dracula, a bunch of other characters in this one mm-hmm. uh, graphic novel series. And in the graphic novels, they have the Invisible Man, and it's the Jack Griffin Invisible Man that appeared in the book. But when they made the movie adaptation of it... Oh, I see what you're saying. I thought you meant, like, the actor. No, Jack Griffin, the character. That makes sense. Yeah, but when they made the movie, Jack Griffin... They couldn't use Jack Griffin, so they had to make up... This is a different Invisible Man. Yeah. It's it's very weird. Yeah. Um, I know that's a lot of legal talk. Yeah. I don't think you're that interested in No wonder, no wonder they had to dress up the Japanese Invisible Man as a clown. (laughs) Yeah. Um. If I find that movie, we're reviewing it. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. I I would definitely like to review these sequels at some point, because, uh, to get back to what I was saying earlier, the the effects in the sequels, uh, get better over time. Although I think the best one of the sequels is probably The Invisible Man Returns. Which featured Vincent Price as the Invisible Man, one of his early uh, monster movie roles. And then there was another one called Invisible Agent, where the Invisible Man fights the Nazis. I should also mention that all the Invisible other other Invisible Man characters in the sequels are different characters than the original. Because the original movie, um, he, is, he, he is dies. Shut up. Yeah, so, no more Invisible Man. And that was a problem you had. Uh, I remember you saying, why don't they just shoot this guy? <laughs> yeah, they, there were so many times where I'm just like, you know, like, uh, I remember, like, Tarantula. The dude's got, like, a pistol in his glove box. Um, I think the same thing in, like, uh, It Came From Outer Space, where, you know, guys just have guns in their glo- glove box. But, I mean, I guess we're in England. Um, it's a little more of a proper area. Yeah, I guess so. Um... So yeah, nobody just like, cause it's like, come on, Kemp. He at this point he has just threatened to crash a train. I think at this point you can say this guy he's a little out of his mind. So just you know. Yeah, Kemp just does not want to be bothered. He's just like terrified, absolutely one hundred percent. Um, but anyway, I think a machine gun would have been real handy. How do we find him? I don't know. Uh, there he is. Dead. <laughs> I mean, realistically, yeah, that would work, but uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't would have much too. of a movie. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is true. Like, the other Universal Monster characters are monsters, but this guy yeah. is just... this guy's just a dude who you can't see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. All right, so what rating would you give this movie? i give this film a 7 out of 10. 7 out of 10? Yeah. Um... Uh, I guess what are your pros and cons for it? Um, well, what I said, I think like the biggest problem that I have with it is mostly that uh, early on, kind of pacing issues where it, you know, there's like two different things going on and they feel a bit disconnected. Um, and um, I don't know, I, like the characters are fun, but a lot of like the main. One's like, I don't know, like the, like the Invisible Man's girlfriend. girlfriend and her dad are they're just, kind of... They're just kind of stock. Yeah, they're pretty stock. Um, but, I mean, like, the Invisible Man's great. Um, Kemp's pretty good. Uh, and side then, characters and are then a lot of fun. And some, there's some fun side characters. So, like... Imagine if they made their... They gave them their own movie. Yeah. Side characters. Like, the other Give stuff the that goes man, up. Give the policeman, like, a series where he hunts monsters. 
Yeah. Or like um, they just have an entire series focused on that bar um, and just the other stuff that happens. Just a bunch. Just a bunch of crazy stuff happens at this bar. Yeah. Like, like the monster. next week, like the Wolfman shows yeah. up and like this, like he's disguised like one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, like with a trench coat and overcoat. And he's just like, I'd like to have a room in a fire. <laughs> Not again. Oh man. So anyway, I give this. I, I'm look. I really like. The universe, uh, universe monster. And this, I think this one's one of the best, so I'd, I'd give it a nine out of ten for me, um, because it's a really solid movie and everything, and really good effects, and it's a lot of fun. I also really like this kind of type of kind of pulpy sci-fi. Mm-hmm. And you, and you know what? I will agree with you on there of the of the classic Universal monster movies that I've seen. Uh, yeah, this is my favorite. Uh, because the only other ones I've seen are the, the, creature the three creature movies um, and three creature movies kind of well the first one's first good. one's first really one's good. good and the second one is eh. not so good and, and the, then third the third one is bad. just uh, one of the worst movies I've ever seen yeah the third one is r- the creature walks among us the only thing I like about that movie is the title the creature walks among us because I yeah. feel like that's just a really good title yeah but the movie is just really bad <laughs> that then they do put him in a trench coat. I think they put him in a trench coat in that film. Yeah, God, he looks like Killer Croc in that movie from yeah, Batman. Awful movie. Yeah, maybe we'll talk about Creature maybe Walks we'll Among Us one. Creature Walks one Among Us. Because that, I would like to do more Universal Monsters again okay. in the future. Um, well, um, that's it for us. Join us next time for a movie, and usually in some of the past episodes, I've said we don't know what movie we're going to review yet, but I've been told. You need to have a teaser for, like, the next episode. Okay. So, um... Well, we did plan it out this time. Yes. I will oblige, and I'll give you a hint (laughs) on what the next episode is going to be. Um, let's just say it's unknown. I thought we were doing King Kong vs. Godzilla. Uh... No, we're not doing King... We're doing the Land of... uh, We're doing the 1957 movie of The Land Unknown... King Kong vs. Godzilla is the next episode after that. So there you go, good editor. You got teasers for two upcoming episodes. <laughs> I hope you're happy with yourself. Anyway, that's it for <laughs> us now. I would say join us next time for the other thing, but we've already told you what the next episode and episode after that's going to be. So I'm just going to say goodbye. Bye. This podcast was hosted and produced by John Billinger and Connor Keating. The movie covered, The Invisible Man, is the property of Universal Studios. This has been a Tiger Media Net production.